Okay. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming to the fourth edition of a Game Production Masterclass. This week, we will have a game design topic. And with us is Matej Jenko. And before I introduce him, um, there are like few, uh, few public announcements for the previous weeks. Um, so for homework two, Alan will soon finish with his review. And for the homework three, Andre is already re reviewing it. And as always, I also need to like mention our partners and sponsors on this project. Uh, they help us, they help us like make this awesome project, awesome masterclass, and help us bring all of the mentors to, to you. Uh, so first of all, I would like to thank uh, Center of Creativeness um, and our. This project is also like part of a platform Center for Creativity and is co-financed by European Union and the Republic of Slovenia. And I also like to thank uh, Outfit7 and Triternion, which are industry partners. And in the end, this project was created and made with help from Reveries and Slovenia Games Asso Association. Um, so this talk is going to last about an hour. And then after that, we will have a Q&A session with Matej. And as always, uh, I will also like, put links to the notes, which you can take like community notes video. Um, and yeah, I think now we can slowly start. I'm going to introduce Matej. He, I think, is the one of, let's say, he's the industry for like, 25 years. That is same, same, same as how I'm old and I, I have I had privilege to work with him I think four and a half years ago uh, when I came first into Outfit 7 we did like some small prototypes and in that small session that we had I learned so much from him and um, we had like uh, let's say 15 to 10 minutes of like brainstorming and just rapid prototyping and I learned so much uh, about game design how to develop how to iterate and I think he's one of the best mentors and uh, speakers from Slovenia on this topic. And um, you will enjoy this talk. And I can I can assure you that uh, it's going to be hell of a ride. So strap in and Matej, lead the way. <laughs> Thank you. for. I'm, I'm just not made for compliments, right? Um, right, we're going to start. Now, Rok, is this... Like we set it up, did the interface disappear? Yes, all, all working, all working. Perfect, right? So we're gonna talk about game design. I'm just gonna not gonna waste too much words here because we're gonna rush through. This is going to be a ride for me, right? So if I stumble, you will just share my embarrassment. So about me, seven years I started in PC scene with Arxa Tribe. I went for seven years into advertising. I went for to Outfit 7, worked on a lot of mobile games, and currently we're making an online chess games, which is also mobile, right? So this is my experience. In a way, the guy you are listening to knows how to draw, knows how to prepare and treat an idea. I know my UIs and UXs. I know how to manage and lead a team, and I can squeeze just about anything from production, right? It's within the, you know, the budget and the deadlines, but it's not necessarily successful but I will do it in the metrics. So what does the game designer need, actually? That was something that I, I also wondered when I started, and I still don't quite know, so I went and checked my own skills. Hear me out, right? So I come from art, so I know my Photoshop fairly well. I don't know Unity. That's the engine that most of my games were, were made of, so everything has to be prepared for me. Without help, I'm useless. For the productivity softwares, the Jira's, the, 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 the Trellos and stuff like this, I'm just basic, right? I, I can handle stuff. With 3D graphics, I dipped into Maya once, but like, I mean, it's been 15 years since I UV mapped to Polygon, so I suck at 3D graphics. And I don't know how to code, right? So why does somebody even want me as a game designer here? If you know your Unities and your coding, you're far ahead of me. Where my asset truly lies is that I've been with 30 finished projects and I have made so many mistakes that um, I'm almost embarrassed. 
but that's what gets people calling and listening to me. So one skill that a game designer really needs, we start here, is just persistence, right? That's going to grant you experience, and then you'll be actually, you know, from the start to the end, you'll be really well equipped. So it's not software, really, and it's not literature. It's persistence. Hear me out. We're going to go through it. All my lectures, I really want them to be practical, right? So I, I source everything from my own experience. And in my experiences, an average game design project took about a year. Most of the time, more, rarely less than six months. And I was searching for what would be the topic for you. that I, I just need you to learn something from me, right? So in 2022, I went on the internet and checked what's there, right? All the GCs, the, the Gama Sutras, and every you know YouTube option that's out there. So I decided a lot of it is out there. So I'm not gonna bore you, you know, to death with you know the theory about core loops and the importance of user tests and there are all skill versus chance nonsense, the types of game design. So everybody who's here and wants to hear that now. Just don't be lazy. Go on the internet. There are far better speakers that talk about these topics. The do's and don'ts of level design and getting the job and which books to read. That's all out there. If you're here, just you know, switch off. What I found actually, and what I was missing, that there was a certain part that not a single game designer actually, I don't know, there were, but it's really rarely introduced. It's this part. And I'm not talking about the first month. I'm talking about the first couple of days. This is really important part for every game designer. And this is where a lot of game designers start to cry because this is your first gateway to where the bosses and the companies actually decide, will they even go with your idea, with your whatever. This is before prototypes. This is just discussion about do you get what is needed in the roadmap? Let me start. Why is this so difficult to capture? And why is there not a lot of this experience actually shared out there? It's because this period consists of so many micro events that are usually just you know, erased from whiteboards. All the documents actually exist. They're just napkin papers, right? These are just sketches that just get tossed. All the documents about the project gets overwritten. And this part on all the meetings are never video. Not even a single, you know, post-mortem or making of actually captured this moment. They all started once they confirmed the idea and how they molded and developed it further. But these first couple of days were never there. Now, I even back, I even went back into my old projects and started, and I store everything. Like I'm an old lady about this. So these are like fossils. They are rare. And insanely hard to find. So how could I even make a lecture today without any evidence and without any source material? So yeah, I'm stupid, right? So just for this lecture, I made a game. I came up with an idea the same way as I would do for a client. And I actually kept and logged every piece of process and every piece of whatever evidence that would get lost. What you will see today, and I will not spare even a little um, your patience, you will see how these first couple of days, how destructive and how chaotic this is. How to keep yourself as a game designer in check and not delve too deep, because you always have to be aware about certain things in this period. We will talk about how to present that thing that you will actually you know, massacre out of these couple of days. And why the hell am I even using this kitchen analogy? It's because today we're not going to be talking about cooking and preparing and cutting food. This is the part where a cook would actually pick a recipe and choose the ingredients. I'll transfer that into game designer's terms, and you will actually imagine what I'm going, um, going after. What is in it for you, right? So um, game design is an exercise in iterations. Every game actually starts revealing itself as you go along. The changes are a constant thing. But if there are too many changes at the wrong times, you will just explode the project, right? So the project will go into a spiral. And that's why so many of the things that people start do not get made. These changes are necessary, but they're also a killer. And today, I'm just going to show you what 
helps me to actually put all those changes in that first couple of days. I'll show you my madness, my method. I don't know if it's going to be useful. It probably doesn't work for every genre, for every client, for every, I don't know, platform. But this is what helped me actually construct a game that is finishable, that is doable. Because without that, you know, starting a game is not hard. Finishing it is. Right? So we're going to talk about how to treat the changes that are just unavoidable. unavoidable. We'll start with the project. And as a game designer, if you think that you will have every freedom of deciding what kind of game you will be making in the career, no, it rarely happens. Your boss, your company will usually start you with, I need this genre. This is the target group that you're working with. And these are the metrics. They will also provide you know, the brand specifications and the resources you will be given a certain amount of time, a certain amount of people, a certain amount of money, right? And for this purpose, for purpose of this, you know, as I said, I'm going to make, I have made a game, made, constructed a proposal in that first week, right? So nothing is going to be playable. This is just, you know, an insight into my life, into the job. They were given to me, right, imaginatively, a mobile game that is a mid-sized. So it's not something hyper-casual, disposable, and it's not a Korean RPG that takes four years to develop and so on, right? So it's a mid-sized game. They wanted an arcade. It's a casual, casual plus mid-core, but not hyper-casual. So casual, right? I'll work with a new brand, which is in a way scary. I'm given nine months, which is not a lot, seven months for the you know, for the soft launch, which means just a couple of countries to just test it, metric the hell out of it, and then add another two months to finish it and ship it um, through the world. I'm given 15 people. Not all of them are going to be full-time. Majority is, but this is counting all the back-end the analytics, guys, the 3D, the 2D, the UX, the devs, and everybody. So that's not necessarily one of the big things. It's sort of mid-sized thing. And thing requires because it's a mobile three updates with the reduced team of people of five those mostly you know full time right so i'm gonna offer you an insight into my job i'm given half a meal for production cost which is not a lot um and the first paid user acquisition amount which will increase later on if this thing actually catches on fire it's gonna be a quarter million, which is not a lot and that 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 number usually raises up but these are the guidelines that I'm given. If you don't have those guidelines for whichever project you're working on, please demand them. I would not even accept a project that doesn't contain this sort of framework. So what I do, this is still Monday, right? I'm immediately going to go through my backlog and see if I have any leftover ideas and any, anything that contains a good setting that has a nice mechanic, but I will not delve deep, right? So in one of my previous lectures, I brain farted this idea that I would want a platformer where I'm a leg, right? I never developed this idea, but I pick it out for, for this one. So I'm going to do this one. As I'm a leg, I'm actually trying to pick up and collect my body parts. As I find them, I merge with them, and I'm a leg. I was jumping. Now with an arm, I can grab the things. I can throw things. I get the eyes. Of course, I can see the color in that platformer. I see, I get the brains, and whatever, the lungs. I can breathe underwater. You get the gist, right? And I'm bleeding all the time, right? So that's my restriction mechanism, something that will keep it, you know, interesting. So in a way, we are making a Metroidvania in a single big world. And I'm trying to monetize that, you know, health mechanic. That's enough. I'm not going to go deeper right now. First, let me explain what is my job. And if you think that game designers are, the, you know, the people who provide these ideas, they're not. These sort of early brain farts can come from just about anybody, you know, it could be secretary, you know, like a nephew of a boss, whatever that has happened. Those things are not in your job description usually. And sometimes the bosses will give it to you. Sometimes even the brand will condition it. What your job actually is, is that you would organize those ideas into doable systems, doable systems, which actually entails that you are an engineer, right? You're dealing with organize the word system, the word doable, what you're doing is you're creating a blueprint and instructions on how to create and construct this game, which has to be fun. That's your job, right? 
you are in a way architect. But if you think that architect just makes a shape of an airport and then that's it, no, no, he has to do a lot more technical parts. So that's your job, right? Have to be prone, a little bit disciplined to organize stuff. So I started working on this, you know, brain fart. So I first said, you know, that I will need a horizontal um, view. I want to set my immediate scales, you know, where in the, in, the, in the screen is my character, you know, what's the unit of a jump. But I don't go deep, right? I just sketch. These are the napkins. I redrew them so you will actually be able to follow. Otherwise, these are fuck ugly stuff, you know, really on the A4 paper with probably some crayon laying around the kitchen. I need input and I'm immediately aware I'm dealing with mobile so I have on screen controls mm, there's going to be a problem later on if I want to be too hardcore I probably need some space for the interface I know that you know the ratio of the screen stretches with mobile devices and I'll be dealing with tablets so I have to know and be aware of the environment and how much it will bleed through on different devices right for the whole world that's much uglier on the paper, right? It's usually just a blob. But this is my level. This is my world, right? That's a big monster, and I'm just crawling through there. It's in trails, and uh, right at this point, if somebody sneaks into my office and starts seeing, oh my god, this is happening, and some artist wants to already do, I don't know, you know, like concept art, I would kick the hell out of him. And no, this is still raw. I want to keep this one within, you know, just one person. It's not control freaky thing. I'll show you why, because I'm going to destroy all this immediately. This is just my starting point. These are the guidelines. Now, listening really hard, because this is important. I'm going to go deep, right? And I'm going to lose a lot of you here. But I'm going to start thinking like a product manager. The game designer is mostly dependent on VP, product, CPOs, and so on, right? So they would actually be the guys confirming your stuff. Can it make money? I know it's mobile, I know it's arcade, it's free to play, has to make money with advertising. I'm sorry, I have to be aware of that. And I already know that daily active user, every daily active user to yield some money would have to watch one or two rewarded video a day. That's not enough. I would probably have to, if I don't increase that number of rewarded videos, I would probably have to sneak in six to eight interstitial ads. Those are the annoying little ads that kill your attention between the screens, right? I would hope that I would not need banners, but I would consider them and I would want 10% of my revenue of my money to come from in-app purchases from the jam packs and premium stuff, right? These are my guidelines. I'm not saying that that's going to happen. I'm saying that this is a goal that I'm going for. It's actually even more um, exact as you go along. And there are people that are much more proficient on this and they would actually provide you this. But if they don't, you have to set it. So my average revenue per daily active users, I wanted to have two cents, right? I need to squeeze out two cents out of every user per day through ads, through in-apps. And I, to actually get this train going, I would need 150,000 daily active users. That is when this project and the metrics that they've set me make sense. And those are low numbers. Even if they're scary, these are sort of low numbers. This is break-even-ish kind of, you know, if I get that, maybe they will allow the world release, they will allow a couple of new updates and squeeze more money into the thing. Aim high, really. Let it scare you a little bit. I know about the distribution in 2022. I need my paid user acquisition money. I'll not get a lot of organic. This is a new brand. I would aim and request that at least, you know, the, the, the people who manage the networks and the ads, that they would actually aim for at least 10% of my user base from USA. And I need my retention metrics, at least, you know, to question my progress. Is it even possible, right? Re remember that monster and the lag and the thing. I will actually constantly transpose myself. That's still Monday through these sort of guidelines. For day one retention, my soft launch, I want 34%. That means that 34% of players that downloaded this app on day one are still playing. Yes, they're cruel numbers. These are not consoles or PC premiums and so on. Then people actually leave out of these games immediately. In soft launch day 30, I would not even concentrate. I would want to create something that retains day one, day three, possibly day seven. These are, these are the numbers. On full release, I would increase those numbers, 40, 25, 15, and at least three. And people are laughing. Yeah, how will you do that? I don't have to prove it right now. 
I will probably fail with this project, but these are my guidelines. These are my prism that I will constantly ask myself if I'm going into the right direction. Think like a product manager, really. Uh, if, if, you, if you do not know how to do this, just ask a guy who, who can do it for you. And these are, you know, those were the serious ones. And as a game designer, I need my own. Constantly, when I'm doing whatever the hell on those napkins, is it still doable? Are, am I still within the resources? Am I still within the guidelines of the, you know, just the budget and the people? The next thing is I have to be honest all the time. Do I possess the knowledge and the talent to pull it off? And does my team do that, right? If I'm going, look, one thing is being brave and challenging yourself. The other thing is just going crazy, right? So that's another check that I will also do. Will it run on most devices? Has some dev squeezed and squeezed squeezed uh, a shader in that's just going to run on Asus ROG devices and whole India is not going to be able to play it, right? So that's also important. Can I describe it in two sentences? I learned that in, on Outfit and it, it actually works, right? If you're doing a game, can you describe it, you know, with a couple of sentences? I'm a leg, I'm picking up limbs, I'm crawling through a monster's butt. It's a platformer, that sort of thing. If it's too convoluted, it's going to help you if it isn't, right? If it's more direct. And of course, game designers tend to spiral into, you know, systems and tables and, uh, and they forget about, is that game still fun to play? Good. Here's a lot of text. Don't worry. It's going to get, you know, pictures and everything. What I do? Oh, yeah, this is still, this is still Monday. Research competition. I'm on mobile. I'll go and actually download everything and play through the games, at least five of them. I will actually record my session and I will keep it because this first time user experience is really important. And I would store those videos, do that when you research. Now leave your comfort zone, right? So you as a game designer will not necessarily always make games that you would like and gravitate towards and actually play. You must enjoy making them. And of course, you know, provided they are good. But even if you're, you know, like arcade freak, you're not making Catherine, you're not making Ori, you're not making Cuphead right now. This is mobile, right? So we leave your comfort zone and allow that this actually seeps in. I'll go to the app aggregates, like app any, and however deep, you know, my, my, my access leads me, I'll analyze the metrics. I'll see what competitions retentions are, what are their session times. Those numbers are really hard to get and really hard to believe. But you'll get a ballpark. Can they monetize? What are the comments? Here's one thing. If you're actually browsing through, you know, release notes of those apps, and those actually appear on a lot of aggregates, check which features with certain apps get updated the most regularly. That's where the gold is for that app, right? Just find, you know, which features updated, that's the money maker. Then go to video reviews and just recent videos because your knowledge might be fuck old, right? I, I could be stuck in some old Capcom arcade, you know, mentality that I have to refresh. So really go for the recent top tens, go through GDC talks, go through Gamma Sutras, not until you suffer and bleed through your eyes, but really just update where the world is recently. And that's going to take my Monday and my Tuesday away. So I will store everything. And then this is controversial. COVID out of things. Uh, what I mean by that, don't, you know, don't be mad at me right now. What I'm saying is on Android, there's 400,000 games, just games out there. That's a huge amount of work. If I would go back to kitchen analogy, you don't have to invent an onion. You don't have to invent salt and peppers. You should not make carbon copies of things. But what you do there and what I meant by copying is you would reuse and repurpose those ingredients. If you like, I don't know, some resistance, you know, mechanic from Diablo, borrow it and then combine it with an onion from another game. But do it, you know, within reasonable things. So copying or being inspired by it has no shame. There's no shame in this. So everybody does it. I have to become aware of what I'm working on. Before that, I wouldn't even be able to speak about anybody what's possible and what I can, you know, promise to deliver. 
So I've got my measurements and about the, you know, just basics where the things are. And then I go into details, right? This is going to go fast. In those arcades, you know, the movement speed, I'll really have to define it. Probably expose it to a variable, you know, how fast the things are moving into frame. Is up on my controller a jump? Is down crouch? Am I crawling? How's that possible on mobile device, right? That's a little bit clumsy. If I use up to climb up the ladders, how do I jump off, right? I need a new button. I need a jump button. That's the first thing. Can I steer during the jumps? What's the mechanic in that? Can I stick to a wall? See, this is a change that can happen month three, month four. Some dickhead is going to actually say, oh, hey, me, boy, that did it, you know, like 15 years ago. We should do it. No, no, address it. Just become aware. I'm not saying that I'm actually confirming it right now, but I'm just becoming aware. How about double jump, right? Really fun. Up, up on mobile device screen. That's doable. What about air dash, up and right? That's a little bit, you know, clumsy. How about, you know, air slam, up and down on the mobile device? Not so casual anymore, right? How do I shoot? I need another button. Do I aim? Do I, do I auto aim? Are the enemies aware of me? Are they shooting back? Do I need, you know, like AI sort of logic? Can I jump on them? Do they have health bars? Can they be too strong for me? All these things I have to put to paper. I'm not defining them. I'm just getting aware of this. So I don't be brave and, you know, balls full, you know, crashing into, you know, already prototyping stuff. If I die, I need checkpoint system, right? <laughs> Now, interact? Do I interact with objects? Do I fiddle with levers, with the doors, with the... Uh, that's a third button. Do I push things around? Do I store things? Is that a fourth button? Is where I'm going? Do I have inventory? Swipe controls. Yeah, somebody's going to suggest it. I better be aware of that and consider it, right? So in terms of UI, just watch this, right? So I probably have four buttons already. On, in the line, I'll probably squeeze a fifth one in. There's a health bar, the scores are there, XP, because it's a Metroidvania to exit the menus, the currencies, the map, you see, the scary part, boss HP timers, all my jetpacks, you know, durabilities and shields and magnets. I'll probably have some tutorial and dialogues. Oh, yeah, somebody's going to come up with combo system. And yes, I will compare my score on a leaderboard. See, that's Tuesday. Wednesday, when I get really fucking scared, right? I hope you're going to bleep those curse words, but I, I relax into profanity, right? Um, yeah, it goes on. Do I have inclined stuff? Do I have physics? Can I pile up stuff? Is this a puzzler? Am I solving things? What about environmental stuff? Who's going to do the dynamics for lava? Does the water hurt me? Do I drown? You know, can I walk into spikes? Can I jump on spikes? Do I die immediately? Oh, yeah, of course, we have water. There's underwater segments. Everybody has them. Yeah, flying segments. Why the hell not? Stuff can be shot off me, right? I'm collecting body parts. If I get hurt, those fly away and they land there and I have to repick them up. I'm zooming in and out because it's much more interesting, you know, with the boss level. So I have to have all the assets for the environment, really, you know, because there's parallaxes and stuff like that. Oh, yeah, dynamic lighting. We need that. Can that happen, you know, six months into the game? And you have already, you know, your level set. Oh, my God, that's a nightmare. I really have to clean this. I really need to confirm that there's going to be a dynamic lighting or not. That's what I'm doing. I'm actually saying where are things that this can still, you know, um, this is still able to be made. Oh, I know what the fifth button is, right? It's mana, and I have the whole spellcasting system. That's why you need your guidelines. That's why your Monday has to be about the guidelines and what you figure out that I will piss blood with the controls if I don't control. This is mobile. This is not going to be, you know, catering hardcore the gamepad. You know, it's not going to it's not going to take on this. But I also figured out checking the app and and stuff that single level, single world, you know, Metroidvanias on mobile, they don't monetize. Right. I'm just going to be wasting companies money. This is actually not replayable. It has one playthrough at best, you know, 10, 12 hours, and that's it. And this is what this actually is, is just an indie Steam crap, you know, for 1999. This is not a mobile game that needs day 30. And what do I do with updates? End game content after the last boss comes another two bosses for who? For what? For 3% of players that remain in the game? 
if I would actually want to create that game and I could sell it, right? I could hype some people and artists would make nice pictures. I would screw the company up. I would screw myself up because it cannot be done, right? So immediately I started a new version. Again, more notes, you know, pads and stuff that get lost. This big monster is going to be split. You know, I just chopped it off into body pieces, right? And I started treating them as areas because I need segments. I need fragments in my session. Why? Because I have to earn money. Where do I earn money? With ads. So I'll have to have some gated areas. If I have one world, it's going to be harder to do, right? So I split it. Screw it. Now you're already reading what's... No, don't concentrate. Big picture, right? Splitting that thing. I said, I'm bleeding all over. Nah, it's not going to go through. It's going to cause me more problems than benefits. So I remove the bleeding. And these are the big, <clears throat> the big changes. What I will do is actually race through those areas. I chop them into the liver and the lungs and the And I will time myself. Why not? Right? That's when you see the game designer just staring through the window, you know, like just playing this game and considering this. These are big changes. I don't want to confirm them, but I will want to be allowed at least the freedom to, to go into this. Maybe I'll pick some elements and keep them later on. So I'll compete against the whole world to whoever actually manages to go through that, I don't know, daily race. What I'm already doing is a racer, platformer. I will randomly generate levels for all those body parts every day. I'll check all the roguelites out there, you know, all the spelunkings and stuff to see, you know, how the level generator would work. I will pick some of the currency, right? So I need a currency. It was, I was lacking the currency. Why? Because I want to create another subsection of this game. I want to have the equipment part not happening in the game, like in the Symphony of the Night or, I don't know, in Metroids. <clears throat> I want before the race that I equip my racer, right? And that's how with limited, you know, um, these attachments, I would also control the amount of buttons so I don't get too crazy. Okay, sort of works. I let it starting to hate it but i let it work see why because these are the parts of the game that i've split my levels into areas right the access to those levels i can monetize with primary secondary you know like in apps whatever you know with engagement i can open them up and i can squeeze those things in because i needed to monetize this baby also the continuous you know the the, the, the doubling of the currencies i can also squeeze them in right here because the session has ended it was not endless it has ended i want to do another race in between i have the time to fill with the monetization stuff also the body parts yeah, i can actually squeeze in you know monetization things with the different stuff what i will do here even if it starts making a little bit of sense i would slap myself and don't balance anything and that's the trap right usually when the game designer finds something that could work he starts drilling deep no, no, no. You stay on the surface. These are still napkins. These are disposable. This is cheap. Nobody's bothering you right now. I will use my superpower. This is the first time I'm actually going to sound like a douchebag. The game designer, maybe not, but the, the game designer has to possess a skill that at this point, as I mentioned, that the guy is actually staring out of the window, you will be able to close your eyes and actually play this game that you are actually making. Is it annoying? Is it fighting you back? Is it forgiving? And you will just take notes. And what you will also do, and this is an extra weird part, you will be able to do that as somebody else in your mind. And this is not role playing, right? This is an actual muscle that you have to train. It's an exercise in empathy. What I found out with game designers, that they have one personal trait uh, and the good ones really, it's really obvious, right? So I'm going to count myself with them. I like to have people around me having fun and I can somehow manufacture. That's why I fiddled with every rule for every board game. You know, in D&Ds, you would want to be your dungeon masters and so on. You like putting fun on top of the table you like when people enjoy themselves that means that you like to observe people 
That means that when you're doing this and playing as your sister, as your co-worker, as your brother, as your mother, whoever they, they are, you have that ability to do that. And that means that you would completely reduce your instincts and completely remove your instincts and replace them with somebody else. And you can actually observe how that game actually turns out as being played by others. I know this is far-fetched, but that's the best way I could find to explain. And then you will revert back to your guidelines. And you will immediately see that this is frustrating as hell. Being at the end of the day, 65,000 in the world. Who cares? That's it's not going to drive my attention. And yes, by the time the, the, the race, you know, the daily races, and I'm going to be even lower. So that's crap, right? The multiplayer. I have just put on the table a multiplayer with all the time tracking, the server syncing, the cheaters, and an issue with an offline player, right? What about this character? I had that upgrades where I can actually fiddle with the bandages. That thing is turning out to be a monster, right? It has lost immediately that appeal. It's just, you know, it's getting a little bit weird, right? So I'll have to do something about it. And also these levels, they felt like daily routines. Everybody in my head, yeah, psychotic told me that this is not fun to play. Why would I want to return to that brain races all the time? It have to be amazing, but it's on mobile. So it's, uh, there's no sense of progression. Yeah, I could, you know, gate those opening up, but I would, you know, these are my stadium tracks. These are my arenas. These are my, you know, race tracks, actually. There's no sense of progression. Once I unlock them all and I have to fiddle with that, uh, and this is all ugly. This body horror that used to be fun for me. I hate this, right? That's Wednesday, probably. Right? New version. The character needs to go. So, we're in these times. Virus. It's a much more controllable shape. Um, it's much easier to animate. It goes with the style. The previous one would be animated like South Park at best, you know. So... You know, something a little bit cuter, but I'm still crazy, right? So every appendage will have multiple tiers and multiple, you know, um, coin sinks and different functionalities from, you know, the research that I've done. It goes for the legs as well. And instead of that monster, I'm a virus, right? And I will, I'm on the train with people and I will infect them. And some people will have different immunities. So I'll have some level system where I could actually bridge them and have that currency work for me and that XP unlocking new, more, you know, more resistant uh, immunities. They're on the train, right? So they have to get off sometimes, right? The old man is going to stay here for two days. The lady is going to leave. Uh, probably need some energy mechanic just to try and calm people down that would say that this would not monetize, so I put this one on the table, right? But this is still, nobody saw this, right? This is still me and the dialogue between myself, right? So I'm actually putting on mechanics that have been proven, you know, to work. And once I get bored with this scene, of course, I can just get off the train and board the bus or the airplane or the cruise ship, whatever the virus goes, right? Right, the, 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 the format stays pretty much the same but i'm a little bit more cuter the animation is actually nicer it's all about my mutagen right that's my currency if i get to an end i can mutate i can become stronger i can evolve and just because i'm crazy and i didn't like that you know competing against the world and that racing thing came in yeah why not every time i enter a person of course there's other viruses around to these are other players I would not screw around with collisions, so I would get the asynchronous data. But yeah, I would want to be the first to end the race, to infect a person or to harm the person, get mutated, mutagen, and so on, right? And with all the equipments, you know, I can handle the levels with grappling hooks, or maybe I'm going to swim and so on. At this point, Wednesday, you feel that the game opens up, right? So that's sometimes you also felt it when you were creating games that just about anything that you can come up with fits into the game. And you start piling on, right? Multiplayer, you know, equipment tiers, everything goes in and everything fits. And since this is not my first rodeo, I know that this is a trap. I'm 
putting everything in and what I'll do in my time for, you know, when I'm finishing this game, I'm just going to balance the hell out of everything. I'm going to lose every control of the, over the big picture and I'll just, you know, tweak the variables and so on. And it's not going to be nice. And this is going to happen. And it's going to happen on the project level. To prevent that, because you've tossed everything in, everybody's saying about, you know, minimum viable product. Hear me out. This really works. When you get to the stage where everything is possible, what you need to do, and this is not a could do, you should do, is you just take the most tasteful and the juiciest parts of the game and keep them. You have to find just the right amount of game where it's still special. Just the minimum amount where it still keeps the thing that actually is fun. And everything, <clears throat> since I'm a mobile, everything that I couldn't fit into my release, I can retrofit as an update. And I have the ability, right? If I if I make room for it, the that thing, you know, actually attach later on, it's gonna work. So really, when you're thinking about your, your games, really start seeing where you can cut the fat, the fat, where it's just about you and self-indulging. And yeah, the boss number seventy needs to have two heads, and yeah, you know, about that. No, no, no. Just start cutting down. This one. This is an example. This is an example of self-indulgent game designer. Can you imagine, with random, randomly re generated levels, if I can expose every, you know, my walking speed, my jump distance, my jump height, who's going to balance that? That's the thing where I'll actually lose my mind. This is a nightmare. This is my warning. The, 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 the multiplayer. I immediately have to have a good pairing logic. I'll probably not have players, so I'll have to do the bots. I'll need ranking systems to have fair groups, and this is not trivial at all. Okay, I was happy because I'm a virus, and of course, being on a train actually works, and there's people, but it's a very static scene. And these codependencies that I've tossed, which I could sell if I would actually invite somebody, you know, oh, we could do this. This is also nonsense, right? So I've got some loops about the XPs and I've got the energy mechanic. I never quite like this, you know, like time that they would be, how would I handle, how would I balance? And then I have new areas, do I return and do that in seven months, right? I'm reverting back to guidelines, which if you still don't have for your game, really, you know, just construct some sort of frame about it. Seven months, I have to do all that. That's my version four. That's the last one. I'll make conclusions after. I'm tossing out the multiplayer, right? I know I'm not making sense, but I said I'm going to offer an insight into the, you know, the mind of a game designer. If it's going to help you when you're working with them, God bless. If it's not, ah. multiplayer is out. It's too big. My guidelines would just, you know, it would just kill me. The time thing. It's no fun, right? If I have to beat the time and work against the time and have the time evaluate me, really, I'm working for a casual mobile thing with already handicapped controls on, you know, like slippery screen. The time, nah, I don't want that pressure. When I was talking about MVP to just keep the least amount of game where it's still special, having it special enough being just a platformer is probably that sweet spot that I was talking about, right? So if every person that I'm attacking as a virus, I'm keeping that, is a level, and I just have to beat it, that's enough. That's enough gameplay that I can actually do something about, right? Find my way through. This nonsense, I need to simplify it. Permanent upgrades with all these variables and stuff, we've established, that's a nightmare. If I would be one of seven game designers on a huge AAA title, yes, Fine, in seven months, I could probably balance this baby. No more permanent upgrades. Just at the start of every level, consumables. We're in mobile, right? Who, who am I kidding? Everything that I need for the level, I can buy for my mutagen. And then it's going to go away. Yes, I can offer something for video rewards, but I would keep just the best upgrades in the game. 
you know, the double jumps, the magnet, the jetpacks, the stuff that I can handle, and that I have complete control over the number and the amount of it. Also, remember all these buttons and stuff. I don't want too many of these, even if it's fun. Even if you say, oh, I can make, you know, like a sliding fire dash with an explosion at the end with several tiers of, you know, like elemental damage. Don't. No, your guidelines will tell you. If you have 17 years, fine, do it. If it's your seventh project and you have, you know, like 50 people behind you, fine. Also, in three years, you'll probably do an ORI. You need, you know, a lot of that checks in your thing. So, yeah, no more permanent stuff, just consumables. Everything kind of works. There's no too many combinations. I can just plop them on. It works for the animation. Yes, I can still keep the upgrades, you know, in a sort of bigger core loop that I XP up, but I wouldn't intersect with uh, the, the, the level generator. So my upgrades would deal with longer durabilities. Maybe I would even put, you know, the double jump on cooldown and these upgrades could reduce my cooldowns as an, as an example. Remember, I'm not defining or polishing anything. I'm not balancing anything. These are just surface stuff. This is still napkins. But what I'm looking for is a big picture. Can this game actually connect with all the elements? And of course, you know, upgrading the power of your gun. <coughs> the train scene, something better just in a five minutes thought, you know, it could be a park. This is not booking it. This is just making it so that somebody can then imagine and confirm this, but something more vibrant, right? So I'm in a park. All these timers and nonsense, who would balance that? I toss that one out, right? It's just this granny that you enter. <laughs> it's a wrong word. You complete complete the level. You get to the end. You infect the poor, you know, little girl. <laughs> you gain mutagen. You become stronger. And other people become prone or liable for you to <laughs> enter, to attack. And this is how you continue through your area, right? So when you... Com Complete, complete um, a level, a person, you get those XPs, which would ungate, you know, additional characters and additional areas. That's a loop. What happened here, and when you're drawing on a paper, even if it's stick figures, don't worry, you don't have to draw nice or anything, but it's going to be immediately apparent. I'm going to tell you about the change that would happen with this game if I wouldn't have caught it here. I feel sorry for making this poor old lady ill. This cute little puppy, you know, like the animals and the girls and everybody. I really don't feel okay if I'm a virus and I'm making people feel bad. You know, haven't we gotten enough of this? So catching this makes me consider that if I'm a virus, I could actually heal people, right? They could all be zombies and I make them healthy or they're miserable and I antibody the hell the viruses out of their body and I make them happy. That's another twist that helps. And that thing would kill us if it comes later on. So you would have to arrange enough time at the beginning, what I do, to actually really don't go too deep, but go really wide with everything that you work and catch the most amount of things that could be, you know, that could be changed. But see why I'm not actually letting any artists or any you know developers in. You remember that lag? You know what happened with it? You know as we get as we went through this process, you know, the psychotic, you know, iterations, the destruction and stuff. We, we caught the level generator here, you know, we got into multiplayer, but we, you know, we went out because we had those guidelines. Those guidelines brought us here with the equipment and upgrading from this into this, into these monsters, into, you know, just calm little thing that it is reasonable to have a consumable stuff. Also environment, no artists. Can you imagine, you know, if some person would already, you know, fall in love with this and start making UIs and stuff, and then we would have to revert because these things would pop out. Just try and define a lot, but not balance them, right? This is the principle that I work with. So can it be done in seven plus two months? No time, no multiplayer. It's probably done, level generator. Yeah, I can squeeze it with 15 people. That's the hard part. This character is doable. This consumable stuff, of course, I could even shorten it for soft launch with just four upgrades. It's doable. What I'm looking for is something that would be reasonable when I present this idea to somebody that they would see, you know, my reasoning. 
these areas are really nicely modular, right? I, I don't need a lot of people, right? I can add, you know, additional models later. Um, I can add additional areas later. So for soft launch, I need one yard and a couple of, you know, like stupid pathfinding that they just, you know, mosey about. I've reduced the currencies so they make sort of sense and the core loop sort of stand. Can it make money? How could I predict that? I don't know yet, but I need enough reasonable placements as a game designer that this could actually be developed further. So if I would just check rewarded videos, which I love over, you know, um, interstitial ads and banners, they're optional to people. I need one to two plus interstitial. If I can get three to four per daily active players, you know, let's see if I have you know, placements. I can offer double mutagens. That's the copying part, right? That thing has been working in a lot of our games. If I do it, put my spin on it, it could do, it could work. You know, continuous could be sold. These boosters, you know, one off for the rewarded videos could be a frustrating level. I could really squeeze you in into watching a video to get the double jump because the gaps are just, you know, mm -hmm just high enough that it's kind of difficult, not too frustrating. I can have special characters that I can watch a video. I can screw around with these upgrades and put some rewarded videos in the daily rewards, the ad trains, you know, multiple videos to get whatever mutagens and, you know, stuff like that, limited events, seasonal stuff, you know, Chinese New Year, enter, watch a video, nonsense. I'm not defining them. I'm just saying that I will provide enough stuff that this game is open up and there's probably seven more hidden in this concept later on but that's enough right previous versions were not that easy to do that can it make money with in-app purchases as soon as you get some currency that's gated and it's running out you can probably get one percent of players in i'm not saying i will put my you know left liver on the table for this but yeah, it has an ability and probably i'll employ somebody smarter than me to you know to, to work this one out I hate them, you know, interstitial ads. But yes, I have fragmented my session, you know, to so many screens that when I run, you know, when I finish the game before I get the results, I'll probably be motivated enough that I slap you with interstitial ads and you would not quit the game, right? So uh, interstitial ads, there is room for them. How can I predict if this will return, right? My guidelines say that I need day one of 34%, right? So 34% of people would still need to play this. Every previous version had issues with this one. Does this one still have it? It's not perfect, far from it. But I've simplified controls. They're all dependent on these boosters that are limited, that unlock through time. So I can actually get you, you know, to enjoy and that it's not frustrating, even if it's casual and so on. I have complete control over the difficulty curve. If I Turn, if it turns out, you know, the, you know, it's getting a little bit hard and it deters people that people are churning because it's too difficult. I have my variables and I can vary it, right? I can get the dips and the lows and the highs of the difficulty. So that's something that's really important for retention. I've removed a lot of punishment. That's also one thing, you know, if you're working for casuals, you can work with difficulty, but, you know, if people start blaming the game instead of blaming yourself blaming themselves that's usually bad right so if i remove competition that actually left you just in the dust or the time that actually punished you those are the things that makes it easier for players that they don't have to deal with those and the most important thing do i have my sense of progress my sense of progression is my success reflect thing in the game and with this yard and the things and possible funny animation that's not too expensive to do and i'm clearing out this yard or i'm making them happy that's the sense of progression that i'm searching for right so it's really obvious and then i enter a new area and so on now that was the easy part right everybody can do that every game designer can imagine that every you know like person who've played a lot of games can come up with this with time with practice with you know a lot of mistakes that's the easiest part for a game designer the thing <clears throat> that is really really important for every game designer and nobody tells you that at the start is your presentation and communication skills Right. This is how I work on the game, right? I sketch really ugly sketches. And let's say I've used up five hours of thinking and balancing or just coming up with loops and so on. 
for every five hours thinking, I use another five hours to polish the presentation. And right here, I'm not talking about that you draw them out really nicely. No, no, no. It's polishing, making them concise, able to make sense for a viewer, right? Even when you do your first sketches for your game, draw out your major screens, use stick figures, try and define you know, the UI elements. They have to paint the big picture. They don't have to go deep. So that's my five hours of thinking and five hours preparing this that I would be clear when I actually ship or present this thing. And that's a problem with a lot of young game designers. That's a lesson possibly that would come handy for you. Um, you don't have to impress anybody, but how, by by how deep your you know logic for the upgrades goes. Uh, when you're first presenting this game, this is the first week. You want to stay on the surface. You uh, you really don't want to confuse people with details, right? Because you will have to present it. But you should not present this to many people. Try and present it to two to three most and go up the food chain. Go up to the product managers, go up to the C-level. They, they are your clients here, right? So if you're going to confuse them, if you're going to try to impress them, if you're going to pretend that you have every answer and that you will oversell your game at this point, um, they will have a lot of questions. And of course, their instincts will trigger. And since they are undefined from your side, they will find you that you're just coming, you know, out of left corner with this. And this is, people are panicky with the money, right? So what you're looking for is when you're presenting a game, that that is a communicational tool. So you align your visions because you need these two guys to be on your side when you ship this onwards to, to the production crew. Right. So, yes, they will express their doubts in a weird way. I will address that part of, of the job slightly later on. I'm near the end. Don't worry. You don't want to be defensive, right? So if you are a game designer with really, you know, quick nerves, don't do it. Be, be patient. Ask questions because their instincts right now are really valuable, right? So you really ask them, don't rush with an answer. Ask them, why do they think so? Perhaps, you know, you went too wide, right? And what I also figured out that if I define my sketches too much and I, I paint them really too beautifully, that's another issue, right? They will consider them that this is already set in stone. So it's really that what I'm saying, the skill of presentation and communication. That's something, that's a muscle that you will really have to work with. And don't underestimate it. Because, you know, I'm ending with the useful stuff. The amount of meetings a game designer, a lead game designer, the only game designer, next to project managers and C-level people, you have the most amount of meetings in a development team. Peter, that's how it is. If you're actually going to set a game that's going to take all your time with the balances and everything, you will run out of time with the meetings and you will never be able to address every concern and they will request the changes and you will feel them as a criticism. But it isn't a criticism. You, I was an artist before, and you would consider that artists always get criticized and we get, you know, thicker skin. Artists have nothing on the amount of criticism that the game designers get. Maybe only product managers get more. You really have to be calm and flexible person that this doesn't kill you. Because it's going to feel like it's a, on a personal level. You, you, you really um, have to be, you know, you have to take time, you have to close the arguments, you have to become part of a leadership, however you want. You don't hide in your cave because a lot of game designers that are afraid of conflict, mm, they just start changing the game design on a whim, right? Somebody said, oh, your dynamic lighting has to be in, and you didn't change it. No, you have to stand your ground and you have to at least challenge them back. And yes, still, sometimes in your job, people will force things on you. That's not usually wrong thing because you could be in a tunnel vision, but they would insist so much that you would put a dynamic lighting in. What you do then is at one point, you just have to give up, right? You let them. If they're right, super. 
the best. No harm, no foul. They were right, you were wrong, you learned something. But if they were wrong, they will then revert to your initial idea and you will actually get serious brownie points with them, right? So that's how you create, you know, you establish your rep reputation. So don't be too conservative as a, as a game designer. Don't fall in love with your games, especially not in these early stages where they're just disposable. Of course, it's harder to change something when you're already in love for six months and then they want to chop that thing. That's why you want to go wide and prepare for those at the beginning. Here's a couple of truths. There is no magical book about game design that's going to get you started. Don't even ask that. Never. I, it's not needed and it doesn't exist. And usually you can just, you know, pick a chapter out of something when you need it. But now it's YouTube and it's pretty much everything out there. I'm not saying that you shouldn't buy them. I'm just saying that that's not the magical tool that will get you started. Also, universities. Fine, super, great, but not necessary. I'm not saying I cannot recommend them. Of course I could, but they're not needed for you to become and they will not provide you a job after you finish them. There is a huge thing with thrust, not thrust, trust. As an artist, I could draw something and in five minutes, people would see that I have the talent and they would leave me alone or in two days or in one week. For the game designer, it doesn't happen that way, right? For the game designer to gain trust with their team, it's not about their ideas that they propose. I wouldn't be able to get trust from people with what I've shown you right now. That thing would actually have to be produced and make money to get trust. And sometimes you need two or three projects before you are actually accepted and listened to. Otherwise, you'll always be challenged and it's the correct way. So really, when you're actually starting in the whole thing, do not try to bite more than you can handle because your reputation sort of relies on it. So really, you know, you have to feel that you can handle all that thing. Don't impress anybody with, you know, like Diablo 17, whatever. And the money before you get those tr that trust is also not amazing. An animator is much higher um, in terms of paychecks at the beginning. Later on, it opens up. There is one thing that's going to help you start or be successful in this business. It's the amount of things that you are able to finish. Not the amount of things you're able to start, but finish, even if they're small. And even now, if you're working on your homeworks and if you're actually creating, a, you know, like a 4X space simulation with landing on the planet, don't, don't, don't do it. Really. Find your guidelines, be true to yourself, count your chickens and eggs, really how many people do you know, how many people are reliable, do they have the talent, and see and try and fit something with it. That means and finish it. If it scares you to finish already at, not, already at this stage, you know, when you're starting it, it's, prob it's probably going to just explode. Do something that is doable. And if you have nothing, absolutely nothing to show, and you don't know anything about game design, and you don't care about, you know, going to the universities, but you are driven to it because you love games. Quality assurance, that's the tester. Testing department in every company is the back door to this profession. Just join the team, suspend your stuff, just enter the thing, just observe. You will, you know, fiddle with the devices, but you will see how the things work. I've seen so many people just jump into product, jump into game design, into dev, into, you know, the artists from the, you know, this. It's like in the movies, right? You just become an assistant. You bring coffee to people. So that's the equivalent of, of, of this in, in game design industry. Since this is a masterclass, I said there's going to be homework for some of you, right? So what homework could I bring you? Should I, you know, make you write game design documents? No. I would need, you know, a week to explain how that is actually properly done. What I will do, I've given you a lesson on how to reduce stuff, how to put, you know, your guidelines into things, how to become, how to be true to, to, to your means and reaches. Do that with your proposals and your current game design. Don't waste my time, but please, if you have a problem, if you need a review of that document, I'm going to, I'm going to go through it. You have uh, until this Saturday 
And this is the link, the, 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 the mail address, and Rook will actually fiddle that through me. I will do my best in the following days or weeks. I'm a little bit busy these days, but I will try and help you out. I'm going to leave you with the last thing here, right? That's the second douchebaggy thing, right? So it's going to be a little patronizing. Don't do the maximum. Really, don't do the maximum. Try and find the juiciest minimum. When you're there, then polish that one to the max. Really, that's what kept me in this game. Thank you. Rook, start unmuting your stuff. We're probably nearing the questions. Thank you very and much, Matthew. I actually did all that, right? These are my napkin sketches for all the things that I've been. And I'm not saying that game would actually work, but I wanted to offer an insight into this. Okay. Look Thank you very much, Matthew. Yeah. <laughs> That oh was, uh, yeah, take a sip of water. That was an amazing presentation. I like, uh, bring you. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I guess you can take a, take a little bit of a break. Uh, in between, I'm just tell us a few things and we're gonna wait for the to for the questions to roll in. Um, I yeah, don't but, need a break. no, okay, okay, then we can just, uh, <laughs> yeah, just read them to me. Help me out. Yeah. I'm gonna listen, I'm gonna try uh currently currently we have like a lot of like positive comments everybody's saying that uh it was really like honest talk like uh, really cool like to see first-hand experience um we don't have yet the the questions um, I, I answer everything right they're already making their own games <laughs> <laughs> um yes yeah, so um yeah, as um, they said, we're going to start with the Q&A session. And while we wait for the um, questions that you, you type them out, uh, you can ask anything. Um, yeah, you can ask anything to the to the to the uh, to the Matei and he will start to prepare his Photoshop. Um, I know, I, I'm much, you know, when I start explaining, <laughs> I then think about, yeah, you know, this and this and this. And how I yeah um and just, just a few less things uh yeah uh, next week uh we will have a continuation of this and uh, miha will pre uh, present like idea testing and how to like rapidly test ideas and it's actually going to continue this uh, uh what matei started and go into the uh, uh going to more, more into details um yeah, um, and I think we have a few questions now, and we can just start. Um, and this is the first question. Do read it to me because I mean. Ah, yeah, sorry. Uh, okay. So, hey, awesome presentation. Thank you. Who are the first okay. people you showed? The, uh, who are the first first people to show? Sorry. Who are the first people you show the presentation to? Product owner? Question mark. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in my experience, in, for example, Outfit 7, I went with VP product. If you have the company that deals with titles, and we had a lot of people, so we had a lot of douchebag, you know, titles, but CEO and VP. If they're not control freaks, then you usually go for the, you know, product lead uh, of the, 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 the thing. You have to keep in check. Certainly, you know, I don't know, maybe you have an operational guy maybe you have a marketing i usually kind of didn't have really good relationship with marketing because i really needed to first confirm the core so i actually went with people who could think wide even if they couldn't necessarily get every mechanic and could imagine everything but that was my duty but yeah ceos vps cpos that's the food chain that i would go for I would certainly not want to hype myself <clears throat> with, um, you know, I don't know, like um, the technical director of the thing. I don't, you know, I don't need that first because I wanted, not that I'm not respecting the guy or the girl, but um, I want my sanity checks with the people who actually give me money. And that's why I would keep it in such a low disposable level, you know, like just a couple of sketches. Because if I wouldn't get them, <coughs> pardon, 
if I wouldn't get them on my side, then the technical guy didn't didn't help me at all. Right. So yeah, that answers it. High up as possible. Usually the guy with the money. If you cannot convince him, nah, then it's gonna be trouble later on. Okay, perfect. Uh, next question. Uh, knowing what to cut, does that only come through game development experience or is there a way to get a head start on that? Hmm. You know, if knowing what to cut, really, usually, right, this is going to be a head, right? And there's an ear and there's an eye. Right here, there's a small little voice that lives in you, right? And you just have to listen to it. It's a panicky little bugger. And if that little voice doesn't shut down, and if you're honest with yourself and it's still popping up and it's actually alarming you, that's usually the time that you need to propose a change. And it sometimes doesn't come from anybody else. And sometimes when you speak about this little concern that you have with other people, they would actually oftentimes say, yeah, I had the same thought, but nobody was saying it. So I kept quiet and so on. So what I did, I voiced them immediately. That's why I'm saying, ask questions. Um, would this actually bother you? It does actually this feel rewarding? Um, and I would be curious. I'm not having answers here for my team. I'm having a lot of answers at the beginning of the thing, right? So, so just listen to this one. If it makes you a little bit tight, that little voice, that's the time when you start considering that this should be off, right? If it, there's a lot of those voices, then it's certainly uh, needed. And you should just not be in love with whatever you have. And that's why it's good, right? At the beginning, with those crappy little things, you know, like stick figures, it's really hard to fall in love. Once you have something that's really, you know, like a pretty girl already, right? Then it gets, oh my God, I have a shaky hand. I'm not going to the boobs. Yeah, but this is, this is harder to then kill. So keep it moldable catch that changes small voice next question thank you i don't uh, know if it was a good answer <laughs> i don't see you know i miss you know when i lecture i see the faces i know i, I know, hear the I know. gasps and everything so i'm sorry we'll have to interpret that yeah, yeah, yeah. i know I, I i know that also like um I, I remember like uh, when you were talking about the q a and the back door i remember like you know two years ago we had a uh, full lecture hall of when you were speaking to the at a conference like full lecture hall you can see like expression of people and like you know it was more um dynamic and i know it's really hard like to stare at screen or like stare at me i don't know and like just don't see the feedback and don't see the reaction from people so mm -hmm. um okay uh next question for smaller teams where everyone mm -hmm. wears many hats do you feel a group approach to game design can be beneficial this early phase seems to work best individually with the results presented to others. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have started when I left Outfit and I still love the company. So I'm hugging everybody who knows me from that company. I love you all. Um, I wanted something smaller and it was the same thing, right? So five people, everybody doing multiple things, me drawing and game designing, some product management, the other guy, you know, was like server code and that code and UI stuff and, you know, particles. Um, in my experience, you still need somebody to just sketch things out. And yes, it could cycle endlessly if I have, you know, like five people. And they all bring this to the table. What I would rather see is somebody does it and then takes it around, right? So I'm not saying I hate democracy in this thing, but I would actually ask if this is the case that everybody brings stuff to the table, that they try to at least develop it in a way that I've been, you know, trying to get, you know, all the answer, trying to get the big picture, because I see a lot of people, it's really easy. Oh, how about dynamic lighting, right? I'm using that example. That's not enough. That's something that I would say, look, if you cannot actually also, you know, consider how many people would do that, how much extra time would that need? What would be the first, you know, like working prototypes? Does this work on every, you know, device? Can you ensure me that, you know, like draw calls and, you know, like frame rates would not drop? Don't even come with this suggestion, right? So 
package whatever idea is with as much information. Uh, I'm drawing a ball on the package. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't necessarily recommend. And I would try and, and, and you know, reward people to, 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 to bring those slightly bigger, chunkier packages um, to the thing. Um, and also, if you have your guidelines, right? If you know that in the team of five, and maybe it's a little bit of a loose situation, you still set yourself, I don't know, eight months, I want soft launch. And then within that frame, you will answer this question, is this beneficial or not? Because if this is actually just spiraling this into 12 months, then you have to find another solution. But if it works, yeah. So I would actually look through the prism of, of just my guidelines. What's my framework? What's what's my capacity to do that? So I wouldn't want to just judge it and say, no, it's not good. It might work for you. But, you know, I don't know your guidelines. Smaller teams usually get too loose sometimes. Yeah, we're a garage band. We're going to make, you know, like, you know, a music for the CD, whatever, the album. And then we, we will have, you know, seven years to do it. No, come on and put some challenge into it. Do something in 12 and that's it and work within that. Then you'll get the answer. Thank um, you. Am I, cursing, am I cursing too much? Will you have to censor everything? Uh, no, that, that I mean, I'm going to leave the original in so that uh, oh you can see God. like your... your... <laughs> I'm sorry to anybody who was embarrassing, you know, who well, embarrassed um okay next question is you focus on mobile games in presentation would the mm -hmm. process be much different for let's say a computer game or even a triple a game or is that a completely different scenario it is slightly different you know i i, I don't have much experience with triple i'll be honest and what is triple a today it's probably you know something that starts with 100 million plus today um so I wouldn't want to be smart about it. I still love the manageable teams. I would be scared shitless, you know, to enter Ubisoft with you know, just the first batch of 1,500 people. I know I'm handicapped this way. So, but yes, I would certainly still go step by step and the process, I would still try to address everything. And I know mobile games, you know, has these four major screens. And if you're looking at something like, I don't know, Witcher 3, uh, that thing actually becomes crazy. So, but still, you know, the, the building blocks, no matter how deep they go, if the spell casting systems for, I don't know, the, you know, the, the Witcher game is certainly going to get deeper. But on the surface, maybe there are not more than this amount of, you know, battlefields. Maybe I wouldn't want to force myself to do everything in a week or two. I would certainly need, but you know, the principle would stay the same. I would certainly ask my game designers to really get the big scope, right? To where this is reaching out, prevent them from drilling really deep, stay on the surface to just see if that would work. Because it would be dangerous if that period would actually last for three months because, you know, balancing the, 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 the spell system for Witcher is not, you know, trivial. But I, myself, I would actually do the same. I would want to get everything on the map in that sort of napkin paper. This happens and I have seven levels and does this actually work within the budget? Yeah, I would do the same, the same thing. With slightly more time. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, you have these big corporations, and I don't know, they pro you know, they have, I don't know, you have to probably convince 17 people before, you know, you, you even decide on the title. And the title here is, you know, the last thing, or even, you know, like what the color of the shoes of your main character are. So, right, how do I know? Uh, next question is a little bit uh, easier. Uh, it's uh, yeah. It says hi, Mate. Can you repeat your email to ask for help uh, sure. with the GD with GDD? Okay, right. So here it is. And Rocky, also don't be lazy. Aha. Uh -huh. Yes. This guy. I'm gonna yeah. Also check down with. Uh, correct. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm just going to post this in uh, in comments. Yes. Uh, this. Okay. 
Um, perfect. So, aha, we have also one question again about homework, and then we have a few of them more on the topic. Mm -hmm. um, so, about the homework, I have an idea that I want to make into a game, but I, but I am still a bit new to this game design thing. Can you mm -hmm. give a very quick overview of very quick overview of what should be in GDD? Okay. You certainly don't need. Um, now, what is the purpose of GDD? For me, the first thing is that I keep myself in check, right? So I write GDD first of all for me, and that's a blasphemy for everybody. Now imagine that you are actually writing a GDD for people who will help you make the game, right? With their different expertise. If you're alone, then you just do it for yourself. It's actually just, an, you know, notes to what do you do. First thing what I would do is I actually prepared frames for that. And I'm, I think that, you know, those things will be answered even in later lectures. But I would go with the short description. I am a lag. I'm doing this. No, 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 no. So it's about a couple of sentences of what this actually is going to be about. Then what I would do, I would list major features. In terms of our game, I would say I am a virus and a platformer level. I have a park where I actually inf in, in, you know, infect people. And I have a consumable upgrade screens. And then later on, I would also say I have these areas that I go from the park. And then I have probably a screen for in-apps and so on. Right? I would just say these are my building blocks. And then before you actually go too deep and defining each of them, you do the check if you're actually able to do those things then certainly what you would want, you could probably find, if you're at the start, some reference games. Maybe, you know, just include, because people who are reading this are the people you are working this game with and along. It's not for the players. This is a production document. These are instructions. Possibly add some references. You know, this should look like this, but should play like that and put a link and put an image there if you don't have your own assets. Certainly don't find something that you're in love and start drilling too deep and then, you know, forgetting about all of them. What I would also do later on, I would also ask, what is the purpose? Is this going to be, what's the platform? Is this a board game that I want to be printed in, you know, like Czech Republic and then shipped across the Europe? Is this a freemium mobile? Is this going to Steam? Is this going to good old games? How? What is the price? Possibly, you know, even in the early documents, not necessarily part of GDD, you know, but ask yourself how much money do I have, right? What's the time frame that I want to be released? You know, I don't know. Um, who's going to be, you know, how many artists will I have and how many developers would I need? That's not usually part of a GDD document, but if you're starting out, that's certainly something. And of course, yeah. How will you make the money? And then you go deeper, right? As you as you go and then define those features and you will start drawing them out and you will start, you know, sketching where the UI is, try and find every element and keep yourself in check. Also think about the tutorial. How will people have their first user experience uh, in the thing? And now always just check if you're already over the board because some game designers to be just love coming up with ideas that are probably impossible to make. So something that is manageable. And if you're starting out, that means probably you suck at a lot of things. So what you do, just create a fucking Arkanoid game. Even that, you know, that's going to be hard enough. But if, you know, that sort of thing, reduce your idea. You know, if you're already sort of confused to what else I could include, you're already over your head. Maybe you should, you know, wait with that idea before you do something easier. And I know that's hard to hear. Don't worry, that idea is just going to get better in your head. So do something that's easier and just start by describing and imagine that whoever is going to read this is going to be your programmer or your music guy or your graphics artist and so on. But look, the guy, girl who asked this, we could bore the hell out of everybody who's still staying with us. Send something, just start it. Don't be embarrassed. If it's one of yours, I'll find it 
Rock will organize some sort of meeting. We'll start talking about it. We will put you into the next level. Don't worry. Just, you know, don't be too afraid. Don't forget about the formalism. Just consider that, that these are the instructions on how to build the game. I think that's my answer. Yeah, that, 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 that's really good, good overview. Um, okay. Why am I drawing I... with red? Come on, I'm changing with this one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next one is, you talked uh, you talk a lot about balancing with regards to mechanics. Can mm -hmm. you explain this process in a bit more detail? How do you okay. decide which mechanic to keep and which one to cut, to cut out? Okay, you know that you have a mechanic that you would probably mitigate armor uh, in regards to, you know, like weapon elemental damage, and then you would have some sort of reduction regarding the tier and the, you know, rarity of an item. Right, if what I said already you know, put an equation into your hand and it, it into your head and you know exactly how to handle, then do that. If this just scared the living shit out of you, then don't do the mechanic that is too difficult. Right? If you're thinking about, oh yeah, I want to do the weapon system versus armor check versus the material, you know, versus that, because you know, Koreans actually figure that one. And if you don't know where to even start, and oh my God, so much lessons that I've forgotten about, you know, I don't know, mathematics and stuff, that's your warning, that's your little voice. This is over your head, don't do it. Reduce to something you know. Stay with your comfort zone, and even that's gonna be hard. Do the dice rolls, you know how to do it. Do something that you can prototype on, on your computer. Do something where you can actually sort of prototype or have some sort of tool. Either you know the programming and you have or you have a coder. Do any sort of, sort of vertical slice, some sort of emulator of this damage and see if it's fine-tunable. Because currently you might be in love with the system where seven and German and Chinese engineers spent seven years on perfecting, and you want this for your first thing. What I go with, with where I actually stop myself, is does it scare me more than I feel comfortable with? Can I handle it? And then I start reducing it, because you can find gameplay even in dice rolls, even in coin tosses, right? So don't fall into a trap that i was my early game designs you know when i was a teenager they were crazy you know i had armor tears and elemental stuff and none of those games worked and i was just happy masturbating into this sort of you know this plus seven plus nine and then goes this equals nine oh my god who's gonna play this don't be self-indulgent really reduce 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 down to the level where you can handle it and I don't know, there's probably not a single sentence that I can say that will help you, but that's the only and the best one, right? Until it scares you enough that you will pull it off. Is there another question? Yes, uh, there is. We have a couple of more. Um, okay, next one. Do video ads influence your game design for games where you get majority of users through those ads? When so, uh, sorry, and so cool. there, there is a there is a uh, sub question. Mm -hmm. When does ad design come into play? So two questions. Sorry. Okay, so what I'm looking for, right? And that marketing people who want. I'm sorry for the church. They just they you know they've been spoiled for a couple of thousand of years and they're banging their bells. Um, so if it goes, do you hear them, Rock? Yes, we hear them, but uh, they're not uh, so loud. It's okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. They're gonna stop. Um, they're, they're, they're gonna take their sweet time. The goddamn priest has a YouTube video for this. He's really proud, you know. And they have like twelve of them. Anyway, video ads. I know where you're going, right? So what a theory says you, you know, unique selling point. Why did I change all this body horror um, through the steps that I've been saying? Because I knew that I don't have you know, a really unique selling point or that I have something that's a little bit too niche and too target. Why did I go with the virus plus humans plus something that is grounded? 
just because of that, because I needed a, you know, some sort of unique selling point, something that's really close to the thing, something that could be really nicely represented with videos. In 2022, not a lot of organics will come. You're dropped into, you know, like an ocean of apps, right? And if you don't have something that people would immediately find interesting, you will just sink at the bottom. So yes, it is important that your gameplay and your appeal of this game, if you're working on a mobile, is able to reflect on whichever video ads you're working. And even if you're working with just testing the blank, you know, App Store, and even if you're actually just trying how flexible it is with, you know, ASO, with our App Store optimizations, yes, I would actually change things in game design if it's not appealing and if it's not so, um, uh, so prone to presentation. But I would also keep the economists out of the room because what economists also say, you do a triangle, a square, a cowboy hat, and you know, like a, like a big with a couple of balls, and then you throw all that on the you know on the store and see that this guy gets nine, this guy gets eight, this guy gets twelve, and this guy gets eleven. So yeah, we automatically pick twelve, and we're gonna do the twelve. I know I'm clashing with a couple of people here. I'm still an artist by the soul, right? So I know that Hollywood is making these sort of things. And in terms of business, it is a good practice. It is a data-driven practice. I usually would clash and sometimes even go and be provoked into forcing people to try something that's not, you know, the most appealing. Because that's, you know, that's how we push the world forward. So yeah, up to a point, not completely data-driven. I think the game design is still, you know, an expression of an artist and I know economists will make fun of me so here's one for you so that's how I live okay uh, next question is when uh, when are you too old to try getting me to Q&A for the starting point in a game design career Fucking never you know what Q&A that is old you know he has kids and a lot of brothers and a lot of experience and so on and so forth older Q&A is one of the most valuable Q&A is too full with just young dudes and young chicks Q&A is so important for a game designer for a product it's not just clicking and checking if UI is actually working. It's your life story. You, I love QA reports that actually deal with, well, this didn't feel okay for me. As such a subject, subjective sort of thing. I need that from my QA. You're never too old. Your experience from, I don't know, spectrum times, you could bore those little kids, no problem. But I would appreciate you know, my QA to be as diverse as possible. And it's not something, you know, it's not undervalued. Being in QA is not, oh, like you're the lowest tier in the game. No, we depend on you. Everybody, you know, we have, you know, goosebumps. Oh, my God, the QA is going to start, you know, massacring our jobs. You become important. You start knocking at my office and saying, what have you done? What have you, you know, I'm convicted to actually playing this shitty game. How could you make me do this, man? I take QA serious. And diversity and age has nothing to do with it. I mean, it, no. And if you see the company that would say you're too old for for QA, burn them down. They're they're just blasphemy. That's heresy, you know, for the game industry. <laughs> you know, so no, not, not never too old and very important. Mm, I I could agree with that. Yeah, QA is uh, like uh, also especially for developers, uh, we are almost best friends. Like uh, you you cannot live without them. So yeah, yeah. I, I would I would I'd say and it's hard to, to be a good tester. It's really mm. bloody difficult, really. I mean, there's yeah. a company just testing stuff out, you know, like moving around the world, like a couple of commando units, you know, entering a company, having five guys with them, you know, like testing the hell out of it. That, that happened in PC times. You could hire three French guys that flew fucking first class 
went into your company, worked 24 seven, got you a report. This is wrong. This is wrong. This feels wrong. The third day is screwed. No, 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 no. The graphics, no, that's amazing stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, next question mm -hmm. is, um, is my once camera you know... still on? Yeah, it is. It is. Really? Yeah, All the time the camera is on? Yeah. Turn some light. My God. <laughs> this is, you know, it's got dark. <laughs> Tell me, uh, there's no chicken light here in this room that's quiet enough in the house. Sorry. Um, <laughs> no, nothing special up there. Just yeah. extra room. Mm, once you know which parts of an idea don't work mm. or need to be cut, how do you approach the problem solving process? The, pro the what? The, the last couple of uh, words? Yeah, sorry, I will repeat again. So once you know which parts of an idea okay. like don't work okay. or need to be cut, uh, cut yeah. how do you approach the problem solving process? So how do you like problem solve what needs to be cut or what uh, okay. needs to be cut? I would think, you know, you know, write something. If I start steering into a wrong direction with my answer, just write it again. Mm -hmm. When you start cutting stuff, right? So you have your multiplayer, your forex, your expansion, your areas, your stuff. I don't know, resistances, whatever, right? And you see that this, you know, resistance system is not working. And if you could just remove it, right? But it's somehow, you know, with a little capillary things, it's still interconnected with certain things, right? So he's probably talking about, you know, what if he chain reacts uh, with other features, right? So how do you do that? I don't know. Look. It would have we would have to get down to be specific, right? I wouldn't presume to actually have a recipe that works uh, for me. But once I remove a certain thing, right? So I'm gonna do this, right? I have removed this. I would also remove a certain piece of all these features, right? So in removing uh, a certain malignant feature. It also takes a little bit of, you know, collateral damage on the neighboring features. And that feels refreshing. If you are too in love with this feature and that prevents you from cutting this bitch off, right? That's the first thing you do. You erase this love for this one, right? So that's how I actually help. There is a lot of collateral tissue that goes with this one, but you will breed so much easier. In a way, how... Is there a recipe? Is there, you know, like a suggestion on how to do it? Do it early before they have grown too far together and really ask yourself, right? That's really important, right? You know, this is the start. This is the day zero, right? That's the player when the player started the day one, the day two, day three, day four. If this feature that you're talking about starts actually living and, you know, like showing themselves right around, you know, day 10, that's usually the guys who I cut the fastest. It is so much more important to attend to the features and clean them out, those that actually pop up and become and are apparent in the first couple of days or even hours of your game. If it's about a thing, you know, that happens at the end, and if it's not a narrative games right now, right? Go from the back forward and just cut, you know, if you have some amazing mechanic for, you know, that only comes, you know, handy on the underwater level seven and on with the boss, those are the bitches that, that get cut. And I would really cut them out to make more room for the features that are apparent for the first players, because yes, this is how the players actually come 100% come and this is the line in terms of days day one only you know you're not even keeping half of them in mobile right day two day three then they stabilize by the day 30 if you still keep four percent and you're a game is really impressive already right so yeah the only method is later features get cut faster and yes they will remove a couple of things and you shouldn't be in love and that should be done fast as possible as soon as you get them on the radar you know as soon as you sketch them see these codependencies listen to your small voice listen be honest with yourself and if it's if it's too difficult already or if it's just smelling bad you have the authority to just cut it 
don't worry, it's easier to then take it on later if you if you survive and if you make money. Then it's the best way. What else do we have lying around, you know, on the floor? Ooh, look, look, they're top in. Right, Rook? I don't know. Yeah, that, 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 uh, that's, I think, perfect, perfect answer. I mean, yeah. Uh, okay, next question. We go, uh, so question is, do you ever wish you wouldn't need to design your games around ads and e-app? And the sub-question is, would you like to make a game with an upfront cost and be free to create something original and interesting for you to play? Mm -hmm. um, right now, the ads and the in-apps are not necessarily uh, bad. No, they, they become bad if you object to them. I do object to some of the things, and I have been disappointed. But I'm also a grown-up, so I know that I couldn't have it all on my part. What these mobile things that are conditioned by ads, they have an amazing distribution. A lot of people are able to see that freemium, you know, you never reach those numbers when you were in the spectrum times, even PC times. They're actually 50% of the games made are now mobile. You know, PC has, I don't know, 20% consoles have, you know, like a week, 30%, the rest are mobile. Mobile used to be, you know, like those premiums, you know, in 2013, 14, 15, you could still get off, you know, with, with, with you know, prepaid apps lately, Everybody, you know, comparatively, you know, everybody's with the ads. But even the ads have changed through the years. The rewarded videos are not that bad. The interstitials are also under control. You can tear them out. You can backend dosage them so they're not bad. The in-apps, those are fun to do, you know. They actually express the, the trust in, in, in your game if you manage to do it. So, look... We're coming from Europe and Slovenia. And Slovenia has been brought up on a pirated, you know, environment of PC games, of Amigas, of Commodores, of Spectrum, and stuff like this. We are the PC whatever master race. And we're all fancy about, you know, like microtransactions. That was, a, you know, like a buzzword. And nobody even knew what that means, you know. You just don't have to play them. But there were games that used up that into the benefit of the player. And I'm not saying, yes, a oh, fuck ton of them were just spamming you. And they will drop off. They don't worry. They will rot out, you know. So people, you know, it's immediate. If you go overboard, you immediately see, you know, that your um, retention just drops if you went overboard. So it is a balancing job, and it's kind of exciting to do as a developer. Okay, have I pissed them off enough? You know, no, maybe if I reduce that, no, no, no. It's a dance between you and the, 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 the user that I've never experienced with PC. The back and forth with the user base in mobile is actually really fun to do. It's not extortive or exploitative. It's actually challenging, and you actually care for them. Right, but you also have to care that you will also survive to be, perhaps make another game. So yeah, that's a bullshit answer, you know, for the ad. Yeah, but I hate ads, right? I would go for the premium all the time, but then I would be out of a job because they just, you know, they're just not that many, and they're really hard to do. Um, but in terms of upfront costs, I'm lately really teased by board games. Ooh. Those are perfect little games. They, they, they have no ad mediations and ad networks and so on. So I would like to do that. If you're asking me my personal stuff, when I'm be old and decrepit and couldn't walk around, I'll probably just play an MMO and do board games. Right? So yeah, don't hate mobile games. Imagine, right? They're all for free. And if you don't like it, just you know, stop playing or pay that one dollar. And you know, can you imagine how many tips have you, you know, left? you know, with kebabs, that's it. And you don't get ads anymore. That's enough. I cannot believe I actually stood on the side for, you know, ad-driven games. Oh, last. <laughs> uh, I think we'll do last two, last two questions. Uh, no. Oh, and we 
And we have like one comment from Martin who asked before about the GDD, uh, what needs to be. And he said that he will send something even if he's embarrassed about it. So, uh, but uh, back to the Don't question. Worry. Don't worry, Martin. I will not read it and I will not make fun of you. I will cherish that you actually made your first step. That's how it starts. Be brave, man. Here's some balls for you. <laughs> <Very well. laughs> um, so the second to last question. If we started making the game without design document and we are mm -hmm. like 50% done with the game, mm -hmm. are there any tips for writing a GDD? Uh, and the sub-question, is writing still a good opportunity to think deeply about the game mechanics? Yeah. Uh, so 50%, 15, sorry, not 50, 15. Ah, 15. Uh, yeah. No, it's not too late. Um, usually, you know, some some companies start with a prototype that actually could go as 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 far as 15%, right? Some, some genres actually need those things. Um, I also don't start writing a GDD, you know, the GDD is not a linear thing that you just start and you start writing from top to bottom and then you spend 14 days and it's done. You start writing GDD in fragments, right? So you start a chapter here, you start a chapter here and that thing, you know, discovers that this inner connect and you need another chapter, right? So it isn't a recap of your game necessary. It also helps you build the thing because it will force you that you will write everything that is known. It will force you to actually define those weapons that you're already shooting in your 15% made prototype. You will actually go and start saying, okay, I've got the lasers, I've got the plasma, I've got that ultimate bastards, but I need something in between. And it will actually scope things out. What actually helped me with the game design, when I finished it and when I started, you know, like writing it, it revealed the actual size of the game and i when i actually got to the point that it got scary i actually forced myself to do the whole list of weapons not balancing not balancing them but just do this and that would you know oh my god i have a whole different deal on my spaceship on you know because these weapons you know now have revealed themselves that i need you know like different size slots and no 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 now i have to define slots so no it's not too late at 15 percent. i would even say it's never too late uh, but do it and really just write it try to do the discipline and it's hard and try to do that just write an hour of game design and go out for a walk and then some new idea is gonna pop and then do you know whatever corresponded with that chapter but really push yourself into defining at least the major stuff right maybe the upper marketing stuff and maybe the back-end definitions and the analytics and the firebase rules and nonsense like that could wait but try and see if you're truly at 15%, maybe right now you're at 3% from what your idea is. That's usually what happens when people say, ah, oh, we are at 15%. And when they start drawing the, the, I mean, when they start driving the, writing the game design, they figure it out. Oh, no, my God. No, we're only at 3%, right? So then the features would have to go on. It's, it's a sanity check for you, right? Do it. Yes. Suffer through it. Okay. Okay. And uh, last question. Uh, I would like to know about preparations. You need to stand your ground. Um, sorry. I would like to know about preparations. You need to, in air quotes, stand your ground and resist game changes during production. Mm -hmm. Is it, is it le least failed game with a mechanic in question? It, it uh, on time production time. Right. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna address the first thing, and then you'll have to read the last one, yeah, right? Yeah. So when you're actually feeling that you are, you know, like defending your game versus you know some big, you know, corporal monster here, right? The first thing is this guy is part of your team, right? So that's the first thing. If he has concerns and all you feel that you need to place, you know, the shield at the right time so it doesn't hurt you. No, no, no. Just let your shield down. If you're working with the shield, just shield and you're too worried, you need a talk, right? So what you need, you and that guy will actually have to become 
a little couple of two bodies because you know the rest of the team will actually bombard you the same way and you will need your backup with this friend so i've been talking about this one having accept some of the concerns if it's a matter of reduction and if it actually you know like is killing your game i was always about finishing and i was actually even able to cut off my arm just so the game got finished not for every cost but yes i have left you know little lovely parts of my games on the floor just so these bastards shut up right it is not bad because I was wrong a lot of times. And you have to imagine that there is an option, that there is a universe where you are wrong in this case. And that guy is having the same instincts that you have and his instincts are telling him and they're going wild, right? Maybe he doesn't know how to express them. And maybe it is on you to actually ask questions what worries him. That's usually good. But sometimes they don't know how to actually express their concerns and they're saying, no, this will not work and so on. Now, what you do, you have to remain sort of calm. You know, you have to invite him. I know this is hippie shit, but it really works. People, you know, I, I, I heard a lot of those, no, this cannot be that. And I actually with Fox, I just said, yes, it could be if it would be different color. And we found, you know, a common ground. But um, if you're already halfway in and a lot of people are requesting the change, and if those, people's, if those people are the guys with the talent or the money, it's perhaps the time that you capitulate. I'm sensing that you've already tried everything, um, but let them. Maybe they're wrong. I mean, you can always quit if they're pissing you off, right? So uh, if you're too in love with the game, try this talk first. Try and ask them what, you know, maybe they will see. But don't force them con to, con you know, don't, don't, don't convince them otherwise. They will have that feeling. Usually we find a common ground. We really do. And yes, sometimes this limb is actually, so what? You can grow a new one. You're a game designer. You will start a new project. You will use that thing elsewhere. That's my backlog. Those are all the limbs that, you know, product or C-level, you know, they chopped it off. It's so beautiful when you start, you know, creating a new game. You finish this one, you learn a lot. You know, it's playable. You know, it earns you money. You move along. Talk. I never needed to fight, really. Rarely, okay. I don't know. Did that answer? This this sounds like you know I should hug a guy and actually grab him for for a beer and actually should see what they're actually trying to chop off. Maybe yeah, they're completely think... wrong, right? <laughs> but usually they're not. Usually it's the guy too in love with whatever has been you know done. I'm certainly one that has been the victim of myself. I, th I think that answered the question. Uh, cool. and, yeah, and uh, I also asked, uh, and yeah, also Ines, who answered this, who posed this question, also says thank you. So I think that completely wow. answered the question. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, and I think we reached the end. Uh, um, so. Thank you again, Matei. That was an amazing insight and uh, like really lovely presentation. Thank you. Uh, um, and there's one last, one last remark I need to tell you. Martin says thank you for the hairy balls. Uh, so oh. uh, <laughs> carry them well. <laughs> and uh, we and with this, uh, yeah, uh, we see each other like next week, uh, same time, same place. And in meanwhile, don't forget to submit your homework. Uh, you can also uh, check um, all of our social medias, Discord and email newsletter. And uh, with this, uh, I think it's a goodbye. Thank you all. Thank you all for staying with me. It's been a pleasure. Look, we'll, we'll meet. You know. Yes, for sure. Bye. <laughs> Ciao. Ciao. In